Welcome to A Healer in Every Home, a show designed to empower you to help yourself and your loved ones with natural remedies and natural healing techniques. My name is Begavati Lenahan, and today we'll be talking about breast health for women. Why is there so much breast cancer in our society? One reason, breasts are mostly composed of fat tissue, and fat is where the body stores toxins. We live in a toxic world. Tens of thousands of new chemicals have been introduced in the past 50 years or so. Most of them never tested for safety, certainly never tested for interactions with each other, and none of them tested for long-term, lifetime exposure. The body protects itself from these chemicals by tucking them away in fat cells. And that's mostly, the breast is mostly fat cells. So here's another problem. The way the body removes toxins is through a substance called lymph. It's a fluid, kind of like blood. Blood carries nutrition to your cells, and lymph carries away the waste. Here's the problem. Heart pumps blood, but there's nothing to pump the lymph. It only pumps, it only moves when we move. If we're sitting down a lot, not really exercising, the lymph stagnates, and the breasts are kind of a dead end for lymph circulation. So we have the breasts both as a place the body tends to store toxins and a place where the lymph does not move easily to remove them. Okay, here's another reason. Breast tissue is responsive to female hormones. As you know, if you've ever had sore or tender breasts with PMS, and some female hormones actually can stimulate the growth of breast cancer, and some chemicals in the environment mimic the effect of female hormones. For example, these chemicals may be found in items as common as plastic drinking bottles. Another reason, radiation exposure. And guess what? Mammograms are a form of radiation. Each one, just a tiny exposure. But the accumulation for many mammograms may be a problem. Remember the big controversy when a scientific panel recommended that younger women get fewer mammograms? It turned into a huge feminist controversy with women demanding that their access to health care not be rationed for cost-cutting reasons. But they were missing the point. Too many mammograms in younger women may actually increase the number of deaths from breast cancer compared to the number of deaths prevented by those mammograms. It's really only in older women that there's a clear benefit from lives saved from mammograms compared to breast cancer caused by mammograms. So what's a girl to do? Well, you need to slosh your lymph. You might want to not wear a bra when you're at home and also exercise, especially jumping up and down is good. Try jumping on a mini trampoline or jumping rope without a bra if possible. We're going to learn about European thermography. This is a totally safe and non-invasive way to test the breast for problem areas years before anything would show up on a mammogram. You know, in Europe, Doctors use European thermography routinely to screen women and only send them for a mammogram if they think a problem is developing. In this way, they're able to save women from the exposure of unnecessary mammograms. So let's check in with Jackie Bell, our visiting expert on, on European thermography. European thermography is a medical testing device developed in Germany, approved in 1998 by the FDA as an adjunct to mammograms. I think the reason why breast cancer is still such an epidemic in the United States, and there's really no, no evidence of the statistics changing at all, is that mammography has failed us as an imaging device and as a way to detect uh, breast cancer. The two main reasons is that, number one, it really is not early detection. Mammograms do not prevent breast disease or breast cancer mortality, and they really are not early detection, which is what they claim to be. By the time that uh, uh, a tumor is detected in the breast because uh, from mammography, even from uh, manual palpation by your doctor, you will have already had the breast disease for six to eight years. In Europe, they claim 10 to 20 years. So early detection is not what mammograms are about. With European thermography, because we're looking at the functioning health of the autonomic nervous system, we're finding breast disease patterns in the nervous system years, six, up to six to eight years, even up to 10 years before the symptom actually manifests on the body. 
So as far as early detection, European thermography is far superior. Also, breast cancer is a whole body disease. It involves toxicity, usually a viral infection, hormone imbalance, and emotional trauma. Breast cancer is not limited to the breast. With European thermography, we take that into consideration because European thermography allows an integrative whole body approach to healing and understanding why your body is in a disease pattern. In 2007, the World Cancer Research Fund, which is based in Europe and associated with the American Institute of Cancer Research here in the United States, came out with a study. What they did was they studied 12 different types of cancer in four different countries and they found a an estimated percentage of each type of cancer that could be prevented just with diet, physical activity, and weight loss. So when you look at the chart, you'll see that 38% of all breast cancer in the United States can be prevented with diet, nutrition, and physical activity, weight loss, meaning lifestyle. So let's think about it. Don't you think that having an individual program for each woman based on their whole body health, whether their hormones are imbalanced, whether they're suffering from a low-grade virus that's not really being detected, the toxicity level in their body, plus emotional trauma that they might be carrying around as a stress factor. If we had an individual program for each woman and then had a foundation laid in nutrition and lifestyle, I believe that this percentage could be a lot higher not an imaging device. It has a sensor that we use to touch the skin and take temperature readings. The difference between, the main difference between a mammogram and European thermography is that a mammogram is taking an image using x-ray photography to look at the density of your breast tissue and to see if there's any aberrations, meaning extra extraordinarily dense areas. That might be a tumor, a cyst, calcifications, and then from there, they take that suspicion of a problem and go ahead and do a biopsy. With European thermography, we don't do that at all. What we do is we use thermal regulation, which is the fact that your body keeps an internal temperature that's constant. And we take a skin temperature measurement before and after the skin is exposed to room temperature air. Because what we're looking for is the response of your autonomic nervous system. Now every point that we touch on the body has a relationship with an underlying organ. So we can see the health of the autonomic nervous system for that individual organ. And for the breast, we look at about 13 points on each breast. So we can see the functioning health of the breast tissue. A mammogram and other imaging devices, including the MRI and ultrasound, only look at the breast tissue. Whereas European thermography is a whole body test. We look at everything from the lymphatic system and your sinuses, the pituitary and thyroid, your breast tissue. We look at your lungs. We look at the dige digestive tract, stomach, liver, gallbladder. Uh, we look at your ovaries and uterus, kidneys. So it's a whole body test. Therefore, we can see the functioning health of the breast in context of your lymphatic system, your immune system, toxicity, uh, the functioning health of your digestive tract, your liver. All of those things are important to note so that we know how to keep you healthy and also if you do have a breast problem or any other problem in the body, how to make you well again. The last major difference between mammograms and European thermography is that mammograms are toxic. 75% of all breast cancer in the United States is contributed to medical radiation. European thermography is non-invasive, it's non-toxic. In uh, Europe, and especially from an integrative approach, the doctors like to use European thermography as a first line of screening. Two of the greatest things about European thermography is that, number one, it's painless and non-toxic, and number two, it empowers a person to know what they can do to help themselves. So what I want to do is show you what the probe is like. This is actually not a probe, it's a sensor. It's a temperature sensor that takes a temperature reading and records it on a computer software program in the form of a graph. The temperature sensor just gently touches the skin to take a temperature reading at different places on the body. Under here is the lymphatic system, here are sinuses, 
pituitary, and then we go down the body. So when a client comes in, the way it works is you come in dressed as you are, you stand, and I begin to take temperature readings uh, along the face, uh, just like I've been doing. We actually do all the teeth, the lymphatic system, then you start to disrobe. We do the front of the body, the back of the body, and each breast. And then you stand for 10 minutes in just your undies. And after 10 minutes, we take a second temperature reading. You get dressed, and that's it. So every point that we take a temperature reading at has two measurements, a before and an after. Now I want to show you an example of two different reports. This is what the breast a thermography report looks like. We call it a breast analysis. It has a map of the breasts and then it has also some signatures. This is an example report of a woman who came in to have her breast checked and as you can see the report has two main parts. The first part is a mapping of the breasts. The second part shows the tendency for disease pattern signatures in the nervous system. Now here in the, the right breast, we can see a blue dot. That's where the autonomic nervous system was not able to change temperature. So the temperature was the same before and after. And then there's also a little bit of nervous system chaos in that right breast. And although this is a healthy thermogram, there's no sign of problem for this, for this client. There's a couple things here that will help her stay healthy. One is if she addresses this high lymphatic load, there's a lot of burden on her lymphatic system. It's probably very congested, which can happen for different reasons. And then there's also an organ that's bothering or that is not well in her body. Though she may be asymptomatic, uh, this would be a good time to address that. On this report, which is her whole body report, we can see that the organs that are showing up are actually her gallbladder and her stomach. So she's actually having problems with digestion and this would be a report that she could take to her naturopath to help her with that and also her homeopathic doctor to help with underlying emotional problems and to drain the lymphatic system. This second example is an example of someone who has fibrocystic tendency. Fibrocystic uh, disease is not cancer. It's a benign congestion in the breast. And we can see that uh, this person has a lot of areas, a lot of blue dots on both breasts that have no temperature change. And when we look down into the signature patterns in the nervous system, we can see that she has a tendency for mastopathy, which is breast disease, and also for fibrocystic. So there's a tendency for inflammation in her breasts and breast problems. And when we look at the whole body report, we can see that it's actually her liver that should be addressed in addition to a low-grade virus. So this is something that she could address with her naturopath and her homeopathic doctor. And also it would be very wise for her to have some breast massage to clear up the congestion in her breasts. There's new research that links increased levels of toxicity to carcinogenesis, which is the pathways that allow for the mutations to occur and then resulting in cancer. For example, radiation toxicity can cause DNA damage. Now there are also some other forms of toxicity, such as what we can acquire from the environment, such as chemicals or biological toxins. And there's a collective term called xenobiotics that refers to all of these. The word xeno meaning foreign to life. So a simple thing that you can do to watch out would be to decrease your consumption of chemicals such as pesticides, such as usage of plastics to heat or store food in, petrochemicals that often occur in um, body products, soaps and things like that. And then just read the ingredients on products that you use for your body or for cleaning agents. Most breast cancers are actually associated with either too much estrogens or estrogens that have been kind of changed by the body in a more toxic way. Some different ways that you can kind of steer the body's biochemical processes towards estrogens that are basically less proliferative and we want to reduce proliferation so that tumors don't grow out of control. Some of the ways to do that 
would be to increase your fiber consumption. Now fiber would help make your bowel passages move faster. Constipation is actually very terrible for increasing toxins in the body because the stool sits in the intestinal tract for a long time and therefore a lot of the toxins can get reabsorbed back into the body. Uh, one of the toxins we're very concerned about for breast cancer is especially estrogen because estrogen actually gets bound by a glucuronide molecule which makes it less active and able to move through and out through the intestinal tract. Now, if the estrogen molecule that's bound and ready to leave the intestinal tract sits for too long, a lot of the bad bacteria in the intestinal tract can release an enzyme that would cleave this bondage and allow that estrogen molecule to get reabsorbed back into the body. And this is not good because it increases the levels of estrogen. Another good thing that you can do is to take probiotics. Probiotics are friendly bacteria found in yogurts or you might have heard of acidophilus or bifidus. These good friendly bacteria prevent the pathogenic or bad bacteria from releasing all those enzymes that I told you earlier that allow for estrogen to get reabsorbed back into the body. Fiber, making sure that you're not constipated, and taking probiotics allows for estrogen to be able to properly leave your body. Now estrogen is not all bad, we need that for female processes, but we need to make those hormones and we also need to excrete those hormones and that's a very important point. Indole-3-carbonyl is actually found in a group of vegetables called the cruciferous family. They're usually your broccolis, cabbages, and Brussels sprouts. And what these um, forms of vegetables do is that they prevent estrogen from being metabolized into some dangerous forms. There are some forms of estrogen that are better that basically work for your female functions but they're kind of a weaker estrogen and they don't cause proliferation whereas other forms of estrogen can be very very potent and cause tissue to grow inappropriately. But you might say, well, how do I know how my body is going to make one kind over the other? Well, these are some things that you can do on the external to help your body choose which way to go. And those cruciferous vegetables are one way where you can dictate your body to um, use estrogen and metabolize it in a pathway that um, would be more likely to prevent breast cancer. Also, um, taking folic acid is important because folic acid also encourages that same pathway that we talked about earlier with the cruciferous vegetables. And also, folate helps with preventing DNA damage. So we don't want um, DNA to be damaged to allow for those mutations for cancer to take place. Rhubarb is a great plant. We may almost never hear about that except for rhubarb pie, but researchers have now shown in a product that they've developed called Estrovera that contains certain extracts of the rhubarb um, components. And what that does is that the rhubarb plant would bind to these estrogen receptors in the body and that decreases proliferation in the breast cells, in the uterus cells, and also for men, prostate cells. So this plant is very, very good for not only preventing the proliferation of breast tissue, but also can um, decrease proliferation of, say, fibroids or things like that in women. A low-carbohydrate diet plays a role also in preventing breast cancer. When someone ingests too much carbohydrate, more than what their body can burn, what the body does is that insulin is released to try to decrease the blood sugar and keep it stable. However, insulin does have its negative effects when it's in too high quantities or secreted very frequently. And high insulin levels are often corresponded with the increased risk of breast cancer. Obesity is also a known risk factor for breast cancer. And therefore, losing weight, exercising, and just decreasing the amounts of carbohydrates that you eat because excess carbohydrates actually turn to fats. So you can do that by eating a lower glycemic diet or a diet sim similar to a Mediterranean-like diet. 
and that would help with both the obesity and lowering the risk factors for diabetes, which then actually lowers the insulin, which has a um, negative correlation to breast cancer. So use of a lot of hormones that are exogenous from an outside source, such as birth control pills, such as hormone replacement therapies, increase a lot of the more potent forms of estrogens and thus would not be helpful towards preventing breast cancer because they increase levels of estrogens. Radiation exposure is also a risk factor for breast cancer. Now some protective factors for breast cancer include nursing a child, um, increasing your fruit and vegetable intake, and lastly, exercise, which really pumps the lymph fluid. If you would like to have more information about this, you can visit my website at www.emilynd.com. Hi, I'm Lisa Santoro, and I'm the massage therapist at the Lydian Center. And a focus of my practice is working with people who are living with cancer. And one of the things that I do is something called lymphatic drainage. And lymphatic work is frequently used for people going through mastectomy, people who have survived cancer, if you've had any lymph nodes removed. And what I'm going to be talking today about is just overall general breast health. So I'm going to describe a little bit about the lymphatic system and one way that we can really help ourselves in keeping our breast tissue healthy. And this is good for men as well. So our lymph system is really our septic system in the body. And a way that we can quickly access it is right here, right up above the collarbones. And if you feel where your own bones are, and if you go slightly behind them, and just with the edges of your fingertips, very, very gently, just resting them into that hollow. And what we're going to be doing is just very gently pressing in the downward direction. You don't want to press in, but you want to stretch the skin, just enough pressure to stretch the skin towards your collarbones. This is a main access to your lymph system. Most people have a thoracic duct or a lymph duct that comes right straight up through the body and exits out here on the left side. There are a few people who have one that exists on the right side. And one thing we're going to think about with breast tissue is that the breast drains this way, up into that armpit, or on this side, into that armpit. So it comes this way at an angle up towards our armpit. And it drains in a circular motion. So if you look down, it's counterclockwise to you on the left side, clockwise to you on the right side. So it goes to either towards either armpit or axil axillary area. The lymph nodes lining this entire area, we have lymph nodes here. We have lymph nodes really all over our body, but these two areas are a particular cluster of lymph nodes, particularly in the deepest part of your armpit that drain, help drain the whole upper area of the body, including the breast. So for general health, in starting to do some lymphatic work on yourself and to keep your breast healthy, breast tissue healthy, we're gonna start with that move that I just did right here at the clavicles. That accesses the lymph system for the entire body and it just sort of galvanizes the effect. It gives it a little bit of a vacuum effect and this is actually very good for your immune system in general. So you don't want to do it too much so if you count one, two, three in a downward position and lift off, down one, two, three, downward position. And we're only going down here. One, two, three. That right there, you've improved your immune system exponentially for the day. But now we're going to drain our breasts. So, and again, this is good for men too. So in thinking about where the nipple area is, we are going to go in a gentle sweeping motion, very, very gentle. And we're just going to 
glide, we can just glide along breast tissue. And I'm going, again, counterclockwise because this is my left breast. And I'm just going to come with my hand and I'm just going to sweep around. And I'm going to think about directing that fluid. And we can do this in short movements. We can do it in longer movements, long sweeping movements, but right around the nipple area. And I'm going to be gently smoothing the skin practically up and then up into my armpit. So another thing we want to do, we want to stimulate those lymph nodes in the axillary area. And I'm going to just put my fingertips as high up. There's one spot. It's like almost a little point. You can feel it. The deepest point, and I'm just going to press there. Press, press very gently, but you really want to get up and in there. Two, three, let go. Same. And you can do that three, four times. It's a nice thing to do with yourself in the shower as well. So by doing this for yourself, you can do this on a daily basis. You can do this once or twice in a day. You're really helping the fluid of the breast tissue, of the lymphatic tissue, to flow a little bit better. Hi, this is Miranda here. I'm here to talk to you about my favorite remedy for mastitis. Homeopathy is brilliant for breastfeeding women. I've treated hundreds of them, um, women with mastitis and breastfeeding problems over the 30 years that I've been in homeopathic practice. And Phytolacca is almost as specific for mastitis. It's brilliant. I remember a woman I visited who just delivered the day before her fourth baby. He was a massive boy, a great big healthy 10 pounder. But unfortunately, she developed a raging case of mastitis immediately after the birth. And at the time that I visited, which was just after her GP had been in, she had a fever of 103. She said she felt like she'd been run over by a Mack truck and that she had almost a case of the flu. She said she felt fluey, achy in her whole body. And when her, her, her big baby, not a little baby, her big baby breastfed, she had pains that radiated all through her body. And this is classic, classic symptoms for phytolacca. Phytolacca is available over the counter in every health food shop. And it's safe, it's regulated. Homeopathic medicines are regulated by the FDA in this country. And there's... Um, what they do, this is a form of energy healing. They stimulate the body to heal itself. So there's no residue, if you like. There are no side effects. There's no danger to the baby. Um, her doctor had threatened her with a hospitalization the next day if she didn't start the antibiotics immediately. She was determined not to have a risk of antibiotics antibiotics crossing over to her baby and affecting her as well. She took the Phytolacca 30C every two hours that evening and had a little, you know, break in her fever. It rose nice and high in the night and by the following morning every single symptom had gone and she was restored to her full, former, vital, healthy self. 